This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of November 4th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, legislative leadership has said they intend to focus on an effective spending cap. We discuss what that should mean. Second, some are talking about using a statewide sales tax to fill the budget gap. We explain why that is simply another regressive top 20% fallback position. And third, we focus on a recent article on where global oil prices are headed and what that means for Alaska. And now, let's join Michael. We're ready to uh, ready to rock and roll and, and talk about the weekly top three. I think these are going to be some good, hot, and heavy discussions uh, this morning. Let's talk uh, for a little bit and first and foremost about item number one, which is a spending cap. It's something that we've talked about on this program for quite some time, and uh, it seems like it's one of the few things that all of a sudden everybody came to agree on, although what exactly are they agreeing on? Nobody's quite sure. Uh, in this opinion piece by Andrew Jensen over at the Alaska Journal of Commerce, that was really kind of a sidebar to that article, but I'll let you let you comment on it from the beginning here. Well, looking ahead to the next legislative session, um, uh, I'm trying to pick up what uh, what legislators are going to be focusing on. Uh, one of them uh, is a spending cap. Andrew's article was focused mostly on some comments Bryce Edgman made uh, last week at the uh, Alaska Chamber of Commerce uh, annual fall uh, get together. Uh, Andrew took issue with some of the stuff Bryce uh, said, and sort of his article sort of goes off on that. But one of the things that Andrew did mention, and one of the things that that I've uh, I'm picking up hearing more of as uh, as as headed for a lot of attention in this coming session is a spending cap. Spending cap is one of those things that that everybody can generally agree on it being a great idea. The concept, given where we've been uh, in in Alaska over the last, well, going on a decade now in terms of increased spending, um, it's a it's a concept that most people can get behind, uh, generally speaking. But as with most things, uh, the devil's in the details, and the details of the spending cap has been talked about, uh, and and proposed the spending caps that have been talked about and proposed to this point uh, are important to understand. Uh, last year, uh, uh, well, last legislative session, I guess it's earlier this year, the governor proposed uh, a package of constitutional amendments. One of those was a spending cap. Later in the session, Senate Finance, um, the Senate Finance Committee, in the form of co-chair uh, Natasha von Imhoff, uh, came out with its own proposed uh, spending cap um, uh, as well. Both of those spending caps are uh, spending based spending caps. That is, they take a given level of spending and then escalate that spending going forward uh, by inflation or in the governor's case, uh, in the case of the governor's uh, initial proposed uh, constitutional amendment, uh, spending or, or inflation plus population growth or some, some form of that. Uh, but, but the ones that have been put on the table and the one that that the legislature sort of left as the leading proposal, uh, the Senate Finance Committee proposal, uh, when uh, when things finally wound down, uh, are, are spending-based. The problem with a spending-based spending cap, um, or an inflation-based uh, inflation based on spending-based spending cap, is it can quickly uh, uh, outstrip revenues. 
And to show that, uh, I've done a chart that is on our Facebook page for those, the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page, uh, for those that are interested uh, in, in looking at it. I charted where that spending cap goes. The, the initial proposal that, that Natasha proposed started at $5 billion and escalated by inflation from there. Uh, they came back with a, 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 an updated version, version K, uh, after a couple of days of hearings, and, and that used a $6 billion uh, starting point and escalated by inflation from there. I've plotted that out on the chart, and it shows uh, using the, the, the current sort of generally accepted level of inflation, 2.25% over the next decade, uh, that gets to $7 billion in terms of spending by the, in terms of cap by the end of the decade. Not even the Senate uh, uh, suggested that that was going to have an impact on their spending levels, though. The, the same analysis uh, that, or the same package in which they put forward that $6 billion base spending cap, uh, the Senate uh, showed what, their, what, what they projected their spending levels to be, and the spending levels were significantly less. They started at 4.65 billion, and then they escalated uh, from there. Again, escalating those by inflation, you get to 5.3 billion. That sounds better, uh, but it's not being it's not being capped by the cap. Uh, it's being capped by um, uh, sort of what the Senate has spent historically. The problem with both of those, though, even if you used what they projected as their spending levels as, as the cap, the problem with both of those is they outstrip revenues. Um, and, and that's the problem with any ba spending based spending cap. Uh, it's, it's, if it's not related to revenues, it, it has the capacity quickly, and in this case, uh, we show that it does, quickly to outstrip revenues and, and, and really not form an effective cap uh, on anything. It may cap spending, but, but it, it still leaves a deficit between spending levels uh, and revenue levels. On right. the same chart, uh, we chart out where traditional revenue, and these, this is using uh, Department of Revenue and OMB projections uh, from last session. Department of Revenue were, was in the spring. Uh, OMB was a little bit, well, about at the same time as the Department of Revenue came out with their last 10-year forecast. Um, uh, and, and we chart out where revenues are. Traditional revenues, that is revenues from oil production, oil royalty, or oil production taxes, oil royalty, uh, and a, a smattering of other taxes that we've historically had, uh, that shows that we're at $2.58 in revenues by the end of the decade, uh, currently about $2.24. Uh, if you assume uh, SB 26, uh, but you also assume the statutory dividend, that is that we comply with the law, we're at $3.86 uh, in revenues by the end of the decade. Um, and if you assume Shelley Hughes's uh, POMB 5050, which is sort of the current proposal on the table for for compromise from the PFD standpoint, we're at 4.4 billion by the end of the decade. Right. That's in that's in revenues. But right. That compares to spending levels of 7 billion under the spending cap, the proposed spending cap, uh, and 5.3 billion under the Senate's proposed spending level. So the spending cap isn't really doing anything. It's a nice talking point. It's one that it's one that that Natasha wants to talk about a lot because it sounds good, but it doesn't do anything, uh, and 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 at the end of the day, continues to leave these deficits that we have to deal with somehow. Well, and that that literally is a part of the problem. It sounds good. It gives them something to talk about, but just like the current spending cap, and there is a spending cap on the books, but it's a, it's essentially ineffective because it has outstripped. Uh, uh, you know, what, what we're doing right now and, and is no way applicable to the revenue that we have at the moment. Now, I know radio is theater of the mind, and so a lot of you maybe have heard all these numbers that Brad just laid out there, and they may sound a little more amorphous. I have posted up the graphic that Brad was talking about just so you could see it, but just picture in your mind four parallel lines or essentially parallel lines with a slight increase, uh, you know, from left to right, and you could see that the the Senate, the one that he was talking about, a seven billion, is at the very, very top, where revenues, projected revenues, are at the very, very bottom, with nearly a five billion dollar difference between the two of them. You can't just put a sale. You just can't just put a spending cap in there with nearly a five billion dollar difference and say it's all going to work out. This is the solution to all of our problems, right, Brad? Exactly. And and Michael, it's it's another. I mean, I I, I have a suspicion 
that what Natasha is up to here is another diversion. I mean, it's another way of saying, oh, don't 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 focus on that PFD over there. Focus on my nice, you know, my nice little spending cap. I'm going to have a spending cap. I'm going to solve this problem through a spending cap. And everybody, you know, focuses on the spending cap uh, and and we continue to have these deficits and she continues to fund the deficits through through PFD cuts, PFD taxes, all the while trying to keep this nice, you know, shiny little object out there uh, of spending cap to, to focus on it. A spending cap that would be based on revenues that reflected actual revenues, and we proposed last year, last session, uh, a spending cap based upon a five-year uh, running average uh, of revenues. Uh, a spending cap based on on revenues would be something to talk about because it ties it would tie spending to actual revenue levels. Uh, but a spending cap based upon spending and then inflate inflation on uh, from from a from a certain starting point. Frankly, that's just a waste of time to talk about, and and it's a it's a diversion from the things that we really ought to be talking about, which is how we're going to close this gap between the actual revenue levels um, and the spending levels that the legislature wants to continue to uh, wants to continue to go down. Brad Keithley is our guest. Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets uh, is uh, who he's uh, with. The director of that organization, we're talking about the weekly top three. So the answer to this, Brad, is obviously a spending cap that deals with revenues versus spending. We've talked about that. We've warned both the governor and those who are supporting him that that is an important, uh, that's an important distinction when you're looking at the various spending cap types. And, uh, and what are you hearing right now? Are you hearing any change going towards that, or are we going to be stuck with the Von Imhoff plan? Well, I, I mean, Senate Finance. That's that's her proposal. It's the one she's she and and Senator Sedman stay in control of Senate Finance this coming session. Um, they're they're co-chairs for the two years of the of the legislature, um, and that's the one she's going to continue to drive on. I will say this: the governor's, um, and I, and I'm sure there will be people who will not appreciate this, but the governor's wasn't much better. Uh, the governor's was also uh, spending ba ba uh, spending based, and then escalated. Uh, without regard to revenues, escalated by uh, inflation and uh, and uh, uh, population growth, it got it got changed in Senate State Affairs, uh, and then it went through another committee. I can't recall which committee it went through before, uh, as it sort of worked its way up the process, and it it remained a re it remained a spending based uh, spending cap. So the two that are on the table, the Senate Finance one that Natasha proposed, and the Governor's that has been played with a little bit through the process are both spending based uh, 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 proposals and really, really aren't worth the paper they're written on. They're not going to get us. Uh, they're not going to get us to, to a landing spot. Okay. Um, when I hear people talk about it, they talk about those two. Um, and I think that's just as I said, I think that's just a waste of time right now. Harold says uh, projections. I already have plenty of Charmin. Please, we never see any five year projection on anything that even correctly predicts anything. Jerrica says predicting revenue. Uh, years in advance is like trying to predict the weather next year and possibly be accurate enough for important decisions. I mean, a couple of comments to that just from me before Brad jumps in. First and foremost, it doesn't mean that we stop trying to predict it, at least to perform our behavior. But Brad's whole point here was not necessarily that we need to pry, try and predict revenue. He's pointing out that this is the problem. This is the pro You can't base it on spending of where you're going. Uh, and that's why a five-year rolling average of what the revenue has been at least gives you some kind of baseline based in reality. Uh, you can't just say, well, we can't really, our projections are never right, so we've just got to stop. I mean, that's never stopped anybody from doing it. And at least it gives you a planning tool. So when the crap does hit the fan, you at least have some kind of idea of what the best and the worst case scenario is. Uh, Brad, I'll let you sound off on this. Well, we've gone through, we've gone through what, $20 billion dollars of fiscal reserves uh, over the last seven years, eight years, uh, in terms of drawing down the SBR, CBR, uh, and doing withholding from the PFD, we've gone through roughly twenty billion dollars of of savings and fiscal reserves. Uh, while we've said, "Oh, oil prices are going to recover, revenues are going to recover," all we need to do is get through the next year and we'll be fine. It hasn't happened, and we're we've drained this SBR. The CBR is down to what most people agree is sort of its minimum to help protect us in the event of some sort of fiscal disaster. 
that the state faces. Um, and, and we've had four years of PFD taxes um, and, and those are, are going to continue if we don't, if we don't do something else. I mean, even if you don't believe in 10 year forecasts, look at the three, look at the first three years, uh, which, uh, usually the markets have a pretty good, uh, handle on the fiscal, the financial markets, the, uh, uh crude oil futures markets have a pretty good handle on not in, 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 in none of those three years, are we even getting close to hitting uh, revenue levels that that uh, that pay for even this year's budget, uh, much less the projected budgets that uh, that we have uh, over those three years. So, yeah, I, projections are difficult, but but what do you base it on? If you base it on year to year to year, I mean that's how we've blown through twenty billion dollars over the past over the past uh, uh, seven eight years. So it's it's time it's time that we look at where we think we're going uh, when we make policy that's going to affect us going forward or else or else we just we just stay with the year to year to year uh, PFD cuts and frankly they get worse and worse and worse. People don't focus on the fact PFD cuts, the, the level of PFD cuts we've had uh, in each of the last four years have been higher each year than they were the year before. We had the highest level of PFD cuts last year uh, than we had in the previous three years. Um, and the projections for PFD cuts this coming year, if we stay going down that road, are higher yet. The level of PFD taxes are higher yet. Uh, what these projections are, are giving us the, the chance to do is to see where we're going and to, and to make corrections uh, that avoid us just landing on PFD cuts year after year after year. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaska's for Sustainable Budgets. Now Harold is browbeating me for being a radio announcer. Oh, he says, <laughs> you know, I can't tell him anything about economics. Okay, I'm just saying for planning purposes, we at least need to have some kind of projections. You, I mean, or you could just shoot it into the wind and hope everything just works out okay, I guess, is the question. I mean, Harold, of course, wants to come back to the idea again of uh, SB21 and the uh, uh, SB21 and the oil and gas uh, uh, taxes, which we've talked about pretty extensively on the show so far uh, in the past. Uh, I don't know if you want to recap it again, Brad, but again, there's a there's you know three or four hundred million dollars on the table, maybe when it's all said and done, but nowhere near the one point two billion dollars that they talk about in the new uh, uh, ballot measure that they're pushing forward. Yeah, exactly right, and and PFD taxes. I'm sorry, uh, uh, oil and gas taxes are just a different way of taking money from the future uh, at the levels that the initiative is talking about. You take, you get a billion dollars this year, but all companies reduce investment. That investment leads to reduce uh, development. That reduced development leads to reduced revenue, uh, reduced uh, production in future years and reduced revenues in future years. You're just stealing from the future. Um, and, and, yeah. And, and that's the problem. That's the problem we had under SB20 or under ACES. We were stealing from the future. We corrected that with SB21. Uh, we're doing we're doing fairly well in terms given given current oil prices. We're doing fairly well in terms of in terms of production and revenue levels. Uh, sending us back to ACES or sending us back to something that 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 uh, deters investment is just stealing from the future. Yep. And that's and that's not a solution either. Uh, Brad Keithley continues with us here. Let's move on to number two, uh, which is the discussion. It's Harold's favorite discussion because it's all about taxes, and uh, that makes him so happy there in the chat room. As oil prices continue to sink, we're hearing more talk about now, of course, sales taxes. That's been – I've been starting to hear that in various quarters. Some of the Republican quarters say, well, we're going to have a tax. It has to be a sales tax. But are those sales taxes any better – than the current tax we're paying, which is, of course, the cut to our PFD. Uh, you've got some details from ITEP that uh, make your point for you. Yeah, in, in 2017, ITEP did an analysis of uh, the, institution for, uh, the Institute for Taxation and Economic Policy, did an analysis of all of the various um, uh, options, um, except a flat tax, uh, but they did an, an analysis of sales tax, uh, 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 income tax, progressive income tax, um, and, uh, and PFD cuts as a way of, of solving the budget gap. Uh, and their conclusion in 2017 was the same as the ICER conclusion in 2016, which is a sales tax suffers from the same defect uh, that PFD cuts do uh, in the sense that they're regressive. They cost middle and lower income Alaska families more 
uh, as a percent of income than than the top 20 percent and indeed the top one percent. Uh, the PFD cuts uh, are something like uh, 20 times the diff the, well 10 times the 10 times the difference uh, between the top 20 percent. Uh, and the bottom 20%, the, the, the bottom 20% pay 10 times more in terms of a percent of their income uh, as a result of PFD cuts than the top 20% do. Uh, sales taxes are slightly better. They're five times uh, uh, different uh, between the, the top uh, and the bottom, but they're still, it's still the same thing. I mean, it's, it's still basically a tax form that pushes the burden of government spending uh, from the top 20% off on middle and lower income Alaska families. And, and, and when I hear people talking about sales tax, well, if we've got to go to some form of tax, it's got, it should be a sales tax. It's just the same top 20% uh, coming up with a fallback plan. Uh, they, they, there's some recognition that PFD cuts are too deep, that, they, that, they, that they're going the wrong direction, that, we, that, that on the track we're on, we eliminate the PFD in, a fairly, in fairly short order. And so there's some sense that they need to come up with a fallback plan. And sales tax is their next, is their next fallback because it's the next regressive tax, um, the next most regressive tax, and pushes the cost again to middle and lower income Alaska families. It is, I mean, there, there's, there, there's, there's no end to which uh, uh, people are coming up with these ideas, the top 20% are coming up with the ideas of pushing costs off on middle and lower income Alaska families in order to dodge uh, uh, them paying it uh, themselves. And again, the big crisis here is not the fact that we're talking about taxes, because the bottom line is we're already being taxed. And there is no political will, heretofore anyway, to fix this situation, because if there was, we would have seen a little more appetite for some of the cuts that Governor Dunleavy had put forward, even some of the scabs and problems in there at all. But, I mean, we've talked specifically about things like the Art Council and some other things that had some of those cuts reversed. If we were anywhere near close to actually cutting our way to prosperity, some of those things would have never been reversed. We wouldn't be having this discussion. But since it's moving in this direction, we need at least to try and steer the conversation on it. Um, yeah, and you and you go back you go back to the to the chart we were using for the last discussion, and you look at those revenue levels. Um, it, it's it's it is unrealistic, it's especially you know if, if we were if we were going to succeed with cuts only, the 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 university the cuts to the university that the governor proposed in the initial budget were critical, critical to achieving uh, uh, cuts only. Uh, hundred he proposed one hundred and thirty million dollars uh, of cuts. Uh, last in, in in this year's budget, uh, that that is that was critical to achieving cuts only, and and really I think the inflection point was when he agreed with the university to reduce those cuts from 130 down to 70, uh, and to uh, and to and to span that over or to or to uh, uh, spread that over over three years uh, instead of taking it and taking it all last year. I mean that part one was the university cuts. Part two is cutting out. Uh, optional Medicaid services and, and so on to get to a cuts only option. We're, we're not going down that road. We're going down a road that continues to generate deficits. Uh, Brad, you want to finalize this and move us on to number three here? Any different from PFD taxes? Sales taxes are regressive. They push costs from the from the top twenty percent to middle and lower income Alaska families. Some people talk about you know the Shelley Hughes proposal of of doing POMV fifty fifty. Which is a which is a cut in PFDs, an initial cut in PFD, and then layering sales taxes on top of that uh, as the solution. Well, that's just one regressive tax on top of another regressive tax. It's the it's the top 20% uh, uh, dream uh, to 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 have both tax measures uh, uh, push costs to middle and lower income Alaska families. The solution is all Alaskans need to have skin in the game. All Alaskans need to face the same costs uh, of government as a percent of income so that all Alaskans have an equal incentive to, uh, to reduce costs. Sales taxes doesn't solve that problem any more than PFD taxes uh, do. They just send us down the same road. Uh, all right. Number three. This is the big one, and I think some people miss this. We're talking about, uh, we're talking about where oil markets are going. Uh, there's been a lot of speculation about how, oh, we're going to reach back up into the $60 range. Some of the pricing has uh, alluded to that it, to an increase, although not quite that much. But then something like this happens, 
and everything goes out the window. And, of course, we're talking about the potential for a flood of oil coming from an unexpected source. Hit us with this and then tell us how that affects Alaska and the rest of the world. So the New York Times ran an article yesterday, a very good article, that sort of surveyed the world in terms of where uh, additional is oil uh, additional oil is coming from. Now, the, the, the New York Times had a different slant on it. Uh, it was a climate change slant. Uh, and frankly, they, they, the, their, their slant was a concern that there's a flood of new oil coming. It's going to reduce price, uh, and that reduced price is going to deter conversions to renewables and other new energy forms that, that deal with, uh, with, with their view of climate change issues. And so their view was this flood of new oil is a bad thing because it reduces price, uh, maintains demand for oil over a longer period than, than otherwise would be. The New York Times, the New York Times perfect world would be, uh, frankly, that, that renewables replace oil in, uh, in fairly short order. So they're coming at it from that perspective. But, but they did a great job in terms of reviewing uh, where uh, uh, oil developments are occurring. Uh, there's a new field that's, in, in, and basically they focused on uh, three places. There's a new field uh, going on in uh, coming up uh, in Norway uh, that has, uh, that, that's really gonna substantially increase uh, Norwegian uh, North, Sweet, North Sea output. Uh, there's a field in uh, Guyana, uh, which is between Venezuela and Brazil, if uh, any are, are uh, geographically challenged like I was when I first heard the name. Uh, a new field that's really uh, an extension of the same sort of fields you find in Venezuela, offshore Guyana, uh, which is a uh, Exxon development, Exxon and, and Sinook, Chinese oil company development. Um, and is uh, is is coming on like gangbusters. There are additional developments offshore Brazil uh, and Canada, uh, which is which has had has suffered in terms of oil development because of, of limitations on the ability on pipeline ability to get it out. Uh, Canada is viewed as coming on with additional resources because a couple of new oil pipelines are coming out of are being finished that are coming out of Canada, which will increase takeaway capacity and and restore the development incentive uh, that uh, the Canada has suffered from over the last few years. So, sort of reviewing the world, uh, the Times is saying, look, the world's going to be awash in oil uh, for a substantial period. Uh, into the future, and that and that that even it doesn't even take into account uh, the fact that Venezuela could come back uh, in the next five years. Uh, it suffered sub substantial reductions as a result of internal turmoil. The fact that Libya could come back. The fact that that right now oil prices, frankly, are being propped up uh, as a result of the Iran uh, the Iran sanctions that the U.S. has imposed on Iran, uh, which which basically has shut down the Iran oil industry. If there's a resolution to those sanctions um, and, and those sanctions come off, substantial increased production from Iran comes on the market, that drives down oil. So it's basically, it's a great review. If you, if you sort of sort of look past the, the Times uh, uh, cover of, of talking about this in terms of impact on climate change, uh, it's, a, it's a great review of, of oil developments out there and reinforces what others have been saying in terms of supply side issues that that we're not going to be supply short we're not going to run into a situation where supply is down and that's going to drive price up not only is demand uh, uh, failing as or falling as as we go through the trade wars uh, but supply is sitting out there um, and 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 ramping in the course of ramping up as a result of of these world developments that means a very bad thing uh, in terms of from Alaska's perspective in terms of price. Right, because we're talking about adding a million barrels a day to the market. And, of course, if it had been from the normal players, OPEC, it may have been more understandable. But now we're looking at it, and this could send the prices substantially lower in the future at this point. Yeah, I, I think the markets, I think the futures market is factoring that in when you look at the, at the, at the strip uh, of future prices. Uh, they're staying roughly in the mid-50s in terms of Brent, staying at the uh, in the mid 50s as far out as the futures market goes which is for four or five years um, and I think that just reinforces 
uh, what 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 people are saying about the about about oil prices going forward. This is this really gives you a depth of understanding uh, about why the futures market is doing what it's doing, what the people who are active in the futures market are seeing going forward, uh, and why and why they're they're uh, they're keeping price levels uh, where they are. And the other thing about uh, the other thing about the the important thing about the fact these are non OPEC developments. Uh, Guyana is not an OPEC member. Brazil is not an OPEC member. Canada, Norway are not OPEC members. The important thing about these non-OPEC developments is that is that they're not subject to the OPEC restrictions and the OPEC agreements. So when OPEC or even OPEC plus, which includes Russia, um, decides to restrict production, that doesn't affect Brazil, Guyana, Canada, uh, and Norway. And and so what this article is is saying is, yeah, even if you think OPEC's going to get its act together, even if you think OPEC is going to redu reduce uh, output in order to try to affect price, uh, that's going to have a limited impact on the market uh, because of, of these developments outside of the OPEC control. Right. Well, in the final wrap-up here, less than about a minute here, Brad, what does it mean for Alaska? It means less revenue in the long run, right, if this is the case? Yeah, actually, it sends us right back, Michael, to the first chart we were using uh, this morning. The, these these uh, revenue projections out there for the for the future ten years are based upon uh, Department of Revenue's outlook for increasing price uh, oil price over that uh, ten year period. And basically, what the what the futures market is telling us, and what these reviews of oil developments out there are telling us, is is don't don't. Don't count on that. Don't count on $70 oil. Uh, we're going to be looking at $50, mid $50 range oil for a, for a long, 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 long time again to come. And so even these revenue projections that we were talking about early on aren't, aren't right. Where do you think this is going to lay us, Brad, when it's all said and done? I mean, again, all those projections that we just talked about were based on escalating prices. And now we see that this is going to be a whole different deal. Where do you, how bad do you think this makes it uh, in the future with the, with the word of this new oil glut that's going to be hitting the market? Well, Michael, there's two things. One, uh, we have got to get our fiscal house in order or else we're going to continue these year-to-year -year PFD cuts. Revenues, oil revenues, are not going to catch up uh, to spending levels. Particularly when you when you when you do things like you know don't cut the the university down to the national average, let it continue to, to roll along at about, you know, 180 percent of the national average uh, spending levels. Um, uh, we're not revenues are not going to keep up with this. And and we're going to face one of two things. We're either going to get our our house in order and we're going to come to some sort of agreement on how we're going to finance this state going forward, uh, which will include some form of new taxes. Um, or replacement taxes for PFD cuts, or we're going to continue to do it through PFD cuts. One of the two, and frankly, I, that rolls into that rolls into, frankly, a, a class issue, an income bracket issue. The top 20% want to stay with PFD cuts because they don't have to pay, or you know, at worst, they want to go to sales taxes because again, they don't have to pay much. Um, and the question is whether we go down that road or we go down a road that's better for the overall Alaska economy and better for the bulk of Alaska citizens, the remaining 80% of Alaska citizens, Alaska families, uh, and adopt a more uh, 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 income bracket neutral uh, uh, approach. That's that's the debate that, we're, that we should be having now. That's the debate that, frankly, we're going to continue to have um, if we don't resolve it uh, in the near future, because the, the oil price cavalry and the oil production cavalry is not coming over the hill to save us. Michael, <clears throat> excuse me, Michael Chambers in the chat room says, I appreciate Brad's change in attitude regarding the futures market. A couple of years ago, he was projecting $77 a barrel oil, and I always thought that was wishful thinking. He is precisely right that Alaska needs to develop a budget based on actual projected revenues. And I think that's part of the problem is we are dealing with things that are amorphous and, and are fluid and can change. Um, yeah, I mean, a couple of years ago, things were looking up, but things like, you know, this this group of four now about to drop a million barrels a day out of the market, that changes everything. I mean, and, and this could happen at any time. That's the problem with projecting it, uh, you know, projecting revenues, uh, you know, based on, on, you know, what you think is going to happen. And I think that's why uh, you've, you've, you've proposed it. <clears throat> I proposed it 
for the state budgets itself, for the budget itself, the idea of saying, you know, let's look at our past revenues and at least it would give us a more realistic approach. I mean, we can pretend that we know what's going to happen next month, but all we can do is plan for the worst and hope for the best. I mean, ideally, we'd say, what have we gotten for the last five years? Make an average of that. At least we'd probably be closer to the mark nine times out of ten. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, that's why we proposed uh, a rolling average for, for the spending cap, rolling average of revenues uh, for the spending cap. Um, the Part of part of the reason for the the, the change in oil price uh, has been uh, shale. Uh, shale's come on heavier than than I think people uh, anticipated four or five years ago. Part of the change is the is the decreased demand. Uh, I don't think people anticipated that we were going to go into a trade war that had had an effect uh, had a, 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 an adverse effect uh, on demand. Um, and yeah, these things these things are difficult to predict over time. Uh, but what you need to what what and and so the reason that we've proposed a, a, a rolling average revenue spending cap is to adjust for those uh, as as they go forward. Absolutely, uh, Harold says. Put Natasha von Imhoff in charge of the budget office and make a run for the hills. Apparently, he's trying to hand grenade it early so that we can at least pick up the pieces, I guess, before it's all said and done. Um, any final thoughts here, Brad, in the last 90 seconds or so? Yeah, we, we, we need to be confronting these issues. We need to be confronting the fact that, that the spending caps that people are proposing aren't, aren't real caps. They're just sort of... They're sort of uh, uh, candy that are being sh shiny objects that are being dangled out there. We need to confront the fact that revenues are staying well below uh, projected spending lines. Uh, and we need to have a, an honest discussion about how we're going to fill that. If we don't do that, we're just going to have year after year after year after year of PFD cuts, just like we've had uh, the last four years, because that's the easiest for the legislature to go after. And it's what the top 20 percent and their donors, their donors want, uh, want the legislature to go after. So it's either it's either we, we, we sort of gut up and deal with this issue or we're going to continue down this road of PFD cuts. Well, and I think that's the best case scenario looking down the road of continued PFD cuts. I think what you really see is you'd see continued PFD cuts plus maybe a sales tax or some other form of taxation on top of it because there still ain't enough money. I mean, that's really what it's all said and done, especially when you look at their projections talking about $7 billion. There's not enough money to make all that work. Even with the, the, the PFDs and everything else, you'd have to have some other form of taxation. And the bottom line is, is that the spending has to get under control. Spending does have to get under control, uh, but but the last legislature, the last legislature taught us anything is that we're not going to get it down to uh, to anticipated revenue levels. No, nope. so the, the the give in that is PFD cuts. All right, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, my friend. As always, people want to follow you, Facebook, your website. What are we doing here? Uh, Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page is where we where we post things daily um, and um, and try to keep people current. All right, Brad Keithley, thank you so much, my friend. Appreciate it, Michael. As always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top Three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.